Good morning, Gluten Talk. I'm excited because it's high hydration sourdough time again. And me personally, I love baking with very wet doughs that have a lot of water because this means we will get a much more open crumb with bigger bubbles and the crumb itself is much, much more chewy. I love that. The only problem with that is that very, very sticky doughs are hard to handle. And trust me, I failed probably a thousand times baking with wet doughs. And I compiled your list of my 10 best tips to handling high hydration doughs. German alert! Did he just say Z? Yes, we German can't we Germans can't pronounce Z. The? Z? The? Hmm. I don't know. Anyways, off topic, I'm sorry, I'm now going to show you what a bread looks like after following my 10 tips just to get you a little bit hungry. And then we will start with the tips. <laughs> this style of bread is the reason why I gained 5 kilograms since Corona times. Super delicious. But now let's proceed with the tips. And number one couldn't be simpler. Know your flour. On the internet you will see people going crazy about high hydration doughs. But the level of water that your flour can absorb really depends on the amount of protein that is inside of your flour. Also if you mix a little bit of whole wheat into your flour mix that will also make your flour absorb more water. And I just wanted to visualize this for you. This is something you have to figure out for yourself with your flour. This really depends on your setup, your flour and everything. But this experiment will tell you exactly how much water you should put into your flour. I wanted to test what's possible. So I made different doughs all with the same setup. 50% whole wheat, 50% strong bread flour. And then I made another one with just cake flour and another one where I added a little bit of additional gluten. Just to visualize you how much water my flour can absorb on a maximum level. Just a small side note, if you see people talking about hydration, that typically means how much water they use per 100 grams of flour. This is called Baker's math. So if they say 60% hydration, that would mean per 100 grams of flour, they're using around 60 grams of water. 80% hydration would be 80 grams of water per 100 grams of flour. But enough theory, let's get started with the experiment just going to be mixing flour and water. It's always 100 grams of flour. I'm not developing any strength and then I will just let the autolys do its magic. I will let them sit for around an hour and then let's proceed with testing. First up, the cake flour. 10% protein and I expect this to tear. I'm just wetting my hands which is advisable when working with wet doughs and yes it just tears. Now the bread flour and whole wheat and you can see it's doing so much better already. Nice window pane effect. So this would be a dough that I would be comfortable with with baking. Let's bump it even more 95% hydration and you see that it just tears. So this is definitely too much. 100% hydration and I was surprised it was holding together a little bit better but I feel that I might have stirred it a little bit more so I'm just going to be doing some more stretch and folds to check this dough and voila it's going to tear so definitely too much water and just let me show you in comparison one more time the 90% hydration though it just holds together so much better so this would be something that's good but yeah the 90 the 100%, I'm sorry, the 100% hydration, nope, 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 nope. You could bake this as a sandwich loaf probably, but not as a batard or as a pool. And extreme 105% hydration, nope, this does not work at all. But now look at the same though, just with added gluten. I added some more gluten here and it just, it's even stronger than the 90% hydration though. It just holds together. I was literally tossing this around my kitchen because I was so amazed. This was so much fun working with a dough. I'm definitely going to try to bake with a dough like that. And one more time, just in comparison to the other dough and it just tears apart. Nope. So 90% hydration seems to be the best uh, hydration for my flour combination. Which brings us to number two. And number two is you want to have a healthy and an active sourdough starter. In fact, I did a whole episode on this, which I'll be linking right here. 
To visualize this, I took two starters. I fed both of them in the morning and the left hand one was coming from the fridge. The other one I already had at room temperature. You want to make sure that your starter is not too acidy because this means you run into a danger of over fermenting your dough. You have to get your fermentation process exactly right. And number three, you want to add a lot of strength to your dough because your dough is so wet, you really have to develop that gluten network. In fact, I have a whole episode on this as well, which I'll be linking here. But just let me show you three things that I always like to do. First up, you just want to knead. I let my dough autolyze, which means I just let water and flour sit. And now I'm just kneading a little bit. I'm doing this for five minutes typically. Afterwards, I'm letting my dough rest and I'm taking it out on the bench. 15 minutes rest and now on the bench. Don't use any flour. Use the tension of your surface to drag your dough on top of itself. This really creates superb amount of strength. Give it a shot yourself. I really like to do this. And the last part which I always like to do is lamination. It's basically just an extended version of bench kneading. You take the dough, you lay it, on, lay it out flat, and then you flip the dough on top of itself. And basically by doing so, you take the sticky side of the dough and you make the sticky side of the dough stick to itself. This is a little bit tricky, but just give it a shot. This just adds so much strength and the dough won't flow away like a pancake. The dough should, sh should hold its shape afterwards. That's very important. After applying those tricks, make sure that you check that your dough holds its shape. That's really what you want. If you don't manage to have a dough that holds its shape, then you want to try again. Something went wrong, probably. So now have a look. The dough just holds its shape. Perfect. And number four, proper bulk fermentation. You want to ferment your dough just long enough. So imagine your dough, this is your dough at the start like a balloon. And now you can inflate your dough. This is actually what you're doing. <sighs> now if your dough is inflated like this, this means then when you touch your dough with your hands, you also have less of a surface area that you're touching. So a properly bulk fermented dough means you inflated the balloon and you have less of a surface area that you're touching. So this is exactly what you want. And in fact, you can actually inflate your dough. I made a video on this before. I'm just showing it to you now. This is the gluten and I'm just taking a straw and I'm inflating that gluten. To know when the bulk fermentation is done, I always like to take a small piece of the dough after adding my stutter and I just mark that jar uh, with a rubber band and then I can quickly see whether my dough doubled in size or not. And that's a very, very good way to know that your bulk fermentation is complete. You want to make sure that your dough is properly inflated. But you also want to make sure that you don't ferment for too long because then your dough could become too sour. So controlling the fermentation process is even more important with a wet dough. And next up, Nummer 5. Number 5. Avoid pre-shaping if possible. If you are in a large bakery, what you do is you ferment your dough in bulk. That's why it's called bulk fermentation. But now how do you turn that big chunk of dough into actual breads? Well, you have to take a tool to divide it. This is called pre-shaping. You divide and then you pre-shape your dough. The problem is that you tore the dough apart and you want to form that into a nice looking ball again. Then you let that rest for a little bit to allow the gluten to relax and then you do the shaping. And I love working with dough, I love pre-shaping, but this really has been my biggest source of frustration when I first started sourdough baking. And if you just ferment one dough at a time in one container, then you don't have to pre-shape. In fact, you might get a more open crumb if you skip pre-shaping. If you're more interested in the effects of pre-shaping or no pre-shaping, I'll be linking a video right here. Which brings us to Nummer 6. <laughs> Wait, number six. So number six, yes, it's number six. Upgrade your banneton game. You are shaping that dough and you're putting that dough into a banneton. The worst thing, the worst thing that could happen to you is that your dough sticks to that banneton. That's the nightmare. And I had it happen to me so many times before. I've tried different things, but the one thing that really works is 
take a linen for your banneton and use the rice flour. So add rice flour, ideally whole rice flour, and put a lot of that into your banneton. It's going to absorb all that humidity and your bread will just come out fine. No stickiness. That's the worst thing that could happen after you invested so much time into your dough. Nummer 7, number 7, proper shaping technique. Your dough is very, very, very wet, so it's going to stick a lot. And when handling a dough like that, it's super important that your shaping technique is on point. As discussed, I'm not pre-shaping, I'm taking my dough out of the container and I'm placing it on a floured surface. It should come out like this. If it does not, chances are you over-fermented your dough. Use a little bit of extra flour. This is totally okay to use more flour at this stage, not before. Just make sure that you don't flour the side that's facing us right now. Because we will be taking this and we will be folding this into the middle. And we want that dough to stick together. We are gluing it together, basically. Take the other side, flip it over, gently tuck it down. If you notice your hand starts sticking, just use a little bit of that flour from the surface. That's okay. Because it's floured, I can also just easily rotate the dough and turn it around to put it into a more comfortable position. In this case, yep, I'm turning it around one more time. Gently take the dough and uh, roll it in and I'm realizing my hands are sticky so I'm using some of that additional flour. I'm turning around the dough, I'm using my dough scraper now to just tuck it in from the sides just a little bit to give it that tiny bit of extra tension. I'm sealing the edges, but if you're getting started with baking, don't do this. It doesn't have such a big impact. I just like to do it from a visual perspective. I find this loaf much more beautiful this way, but this is of course just my personal opinion. It doesn't have a big impact. Take that leftover flour and gently uh, rub your dough with it. And now we are going to be preparing our dough for the final rest with one quick movement. We will be taking that dough and we will be flipping that dough right into the banneton for the final rest. And it took me a while to get this to work. Just one movement, take the dough scraper and take the dough and put it into your banneton. Yeah, that's it basically. And this brings us to number eight, number eight. Something is, I don't know, something is wrong with my hands. I just can't point it. Anyways, <laughs> you want to be using the fridge for your final proofing stage. I typically proof my dough at room temperature for around two hours. And the exact timing really depends on the finger poke test. Take your finger and poke the dough. Make sure that you have flour on your finger. And then you want to poke that dough. And if that dent instantly recovers, then your dough is not properly proofed yet. Um, just wait a little bit longer and when that dough just very 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 slowly comes back take your dough and put that dough right into the fridge for another eight hours what's going to happen is everything will cool down inside of your dough and that will make it much much easier for you to score your bread the next day furthermore the gases are cooling down the fermentation process is almost halted and you will have more oven spring when you are baking that dough. So for me, using the fridge has really been a game changer, in combination especially with that finger poke test. It takes a couple of attempts until you master the finger poke test, but this is the best way to judge whether your dough has proved enough. And this brings me to point number nine, which is scoring, which is cutting your bread before you bake it. And I have an extra dedicated point to this because it's so challenging when you have a very wet dough. And let me show you how I practice this. You can cut your bread with different tools. Normally what you might want to use is just a knife, but it's important that the knife is very sharp because else you will be tearing the dough apart and this is something you don't want to do. I'm just showing you, those are called lames or lamps, excuse my <laughs> English, let's say a lamb. Um, this is basically just a, a razor blade attached to a handle. And now this is the same, just looks a little bit fancier. I'm just showing you how to score here on the lemon. You can also just use an apple to practice a little bit uh, because scoring to me was always one of the hardest parts because you only get <laughs> one attempt. So we don't want to be cutting just like this. We want to be cutting at around a 45 degree angle like this. Okay, oh, the peel of the lemon doesn't want this. 
So again, not like this, but we want to be cutting swiftly at a 45 degree angle like this. One more time. And now let me show you that in practice. I took the dough which I made the evening before out of the fridge. It must have been around 10 hours and I'm placing it on the very hot stone and then I will show you how to score. And here you have to be quick. Now I'm just taking the banneton and I will flip it over on the very hot stone. Be gentle when removing. And you can see it already start to stick a little bit. So next time maybe some more rice flour. And without the lining cover, we would have been screwed now. Gently remove it. And now we will be scoring this. So again, 45 degree angle, swift movement. And that's it. You can add a decorative pattern if you want to. This doesn't really have an impact on the oven spring, just for the beauties. You made it to point number 10, the last point, and that is you want to have a proper home oven set up with lots and lots of steam. Your dough itself might not have as much oven spring as a stiff dough. That's because we have a high water content. So we need to make sure that the, break, the, baking, the, the baking technique is really perfect. We want to add a lot of steam that we don't create a crust at the start. Steam is really the game changer. Small side note, you could of course also be using a Dutch oven, but me personally, I don't like it too much because I like to bake longer batards. So this method I personally prefer. It's also a little bit more gentle. Some people just flip over the dough into the Dutch oven. There's other techniques as well, but this method really made me the best bread so far. I always have a stone here in the middle, but this could just be another tray. Then I have a large bowl and I will be heating this bowl for around 30 minutes so that it's very, very, very hot. Then I'll be pouring in boiling water. Now this boiling water is going to evaporate and then it's going to be trapped here below this other tray. And this is going to create a very, very steamy, wet environment right here. And this is exactly what you want during the first half of the bake. You want to have as much steam as possible. This means that there's no Maillard reaction on the crust of your bread. And you want that so that your bread can rise more in the oven. And afterwards, after around half the bake time, this depends a little bit on your oven, but for me it's around 20 minutes at 230 degrees Celsius, I remove the remaining water and I also remove this tray and then you will get that nice crust. Just wanted to add, so I don't heat this one, I take this out. And this is how I'll start heating my oven. I heat it to maximum temperature, I use the fan, and then 270, actually interestingly, 270 in my case is 300 degrees Celsius. That's because the ovens really don't always give you exact temperature control. Just so you know, uh, before you just follow temperatures, you might also just want to check how uh, hot does your oven actually get. I'm putting in the tray, taking this out a little bit, boiling water. And this just creates so much steam. Reduce. Turn off the fan, you don't want a fan because else you just blow away all the steam. Reduce the temperature. Perfect, and now 25 minutes. Hello! <laughs> now 25 minutes of waiting and then we will be removing the source of steam. Looking good, nice ear, beautiful. Now let me remove the last water actually been around 30 minutes now. I had to jump to a phone call and remove this. And another close-up. Beautiful looking bread, even some nice bubbles here on the right hand side. 
and I'm just gonna let this bake for probably another 10 minutes or so until it's a little bit darker. And the final result. And you made it! Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video and you learned something new. If you have questions, whatever, just shoot me a message in the comment section. Have a great day and may the gluten be with you.